My third case is Madam Jurida. Now she's a 61 year old lady admitted for a short one month history of shortness of breath, fever and weight loss. Day four of admission, the diagnosis becomes clear. She has a rare subtype of dermatomyositis with anti-MDA5 antibodies, which is known to be associated with rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease. We know that this is associated with high mortality. She deteriorates and is um, intubated for severe type 1 lung failure the very next day. Despite aggressive immunosuppression with multiple different drugs, um, her condition continues to go south and she requires paralysis and uh, ventilation in the prone position to overcome the significant poor gas exchange. Her medical team then start plasma exchange, which is salvage therapy. Um, however, after seven cycles, this is discontinued due to lack of clinical response. So looking at her social history, she lives on her own. She's divorced. She has three children, Sarah, her elder daughter, um, her uh, oldest son, Azmi, and younger son, Kairo. Um, her husband lives with her older son, Azmi. She's very close to her daughter and she takes quite an active role in looking after her three grandchildren. So she values her independence, she cooks, she goes out and she does Zumba. However, there's no advanced medical directive or advanced care plan. Now, within this family, the patient's younger son, Cairo, is not close to anyone. It's important to, to be aware of this. So after the one month stormy stay in the intensive care unit, the goals of care are discussed with her family members. Her daughter, Sarah, is a nurse and she's the main spokesperson. And both Sarah and Madam Jurida's sister believe that Madam Jurida would not want suffering to be prolonged without a good quality of life uh, based on her interests and what she's um, uh, kind of talked about. So uh, do not resuscitate status was established and over the next few days management goals were increasingly conservative. Six weeks into the admission, most of the family were agreeable for comfort care. Uh, as part of this, withdrawal of ventilatory support was discussed and it was predicted that demise would be imminent with terminal extubation. However, there was a voice of dissent Kairul, her younger son, fought and said, Mum would not give up. She's a fighter. And he spoke up and said that comfort care and withdrawal of care was unacceptable. Um, and it was difficult um, speaking with him because he questioned every decision made, not just by the medical team, but by his siblings, and felt that the team was not doing enough for his mother. And he... Um, started talking about obtaining other opinions and then began to speak about how the medical team was not doing enough in terms of uh, the drugs that had been used for his mother. Over the next two weeks, she remained on the ventilator while the medical team navigated multiple family conferences. Cairo fought against um, what the family had agreed on, which was for terminal extubation. Um, at this point in time, she required three sedatives on the ventilator, and Sarah eventually relegated the role of main spokesperson to her brother, Cairo, because she was emotionally drained by the conflict. At the end, uh, three weeks after the initial discussion for terminal extubation, Cairo said he wanted his mother alive, regardless of quality of life. And the reason he said was that he had personal matters to resolve with her um, because of um, abusive behaviour towards him in the past. He, he did not elaborate further. She passed away on the ventilator seven weeks after intubation on the very same day as that last family conference. So what are some of the ethical dilemmas that um, arise with this case? Was it right 
to delay withdrawal of care for her um, because she was suffering for so long on the ventilator. And it begs the question, could the medical team have actually made the decision to withdraw ventilatory support on the grounds of medical futility alone? Um, the healthcare teams that were managing her suffered very significant moral distress. In actual practice, where the patient's wishes are not explicit and family members have differing views on what they think the patient wants, it is good to find a way to reframe what would the patient's last wishes be. Uh, my final case is Kanan, a 45-year-old man admitted for recurrent falls. In local vernacular, what is known as a frequent flyer. His history is that of HIV, malnutrition and chronic alcoholism for the last two decades with cognitive impairment. So he is admitted and is found to have pneumocystis pneumonia um, because he has not been taking his antiretrovirals. His social history is significant for the fact that he is homeless and lives on void decks. He actually has three siblings whom He's, he doesn't have good relationships with. They give him $50 a month, which he spends entirely on alcohol. And they say that he's out of control and they do not know how to help him. So you are on the ward, you go to see him on your morning ward round and he demands discharge. Uh, you bring up again the issue of long-term care, but he adamantly refuses this. And... Um, this is an ongoing conversation that happens each time he is admitted. And uh, it's because um, he, he wants to be able to go out to have a drink. Uh, and he would not be able to do this if he is institutionalized. So what is in his best interest? So let us think about whether or not Kanan actually understands the benefits and risks of not adhering to the antiretroviral treatments. Does he indeed have capacity or is it fluctuating capacity? Um, we know he has got cognitive impairment. Um, how do you demonstrate evidence of capacity? And then he adamantly states that he does not want long-term care. So what are the preferences about treatment that he is he stating? In addition, he doesn't take his antiretroviral medications. Is there an appropriate surrogate to make decisions? And then we ask, is he unwilling or is he unable to cooperate with treatment? So here we, we think about the principle of respect, of autonomy. So this slide shows some of the myths and realities about healthcare teamwork. The first point, healthcare teams should avoid conflict. In reality, we know that conflict helps teams grow and through that they become high-performing teams. Many people think that teamwork just happens, but as in the second point, be, being an effective team member, it is not an inherent skill. So the reality is that skill development is required, especially in complex healthcare teams that sometimes form disband within days. Take for example um, uh, CPR. That is a team that suddenly forms on the moment and is there just for the moment of uh, CPR before then transferring to an acute hospital setting. Myth number three, conflict should be resolved. Sometimes it can't be and the reality is that we need to actually embrace it and walk through that journey um, to manage the conflict. Myth number four, interprofessional equals collaboration. However, we know in reality, interprofessional equals many, many challenges to collaboration. So, interprofessional collaborative care requires skill development and practice. Myth number five, major differences lead to conflict. We know, however, that actually minor concerns may lead to major conflict. 
And finally, and the myth number five, power hierarchies are a norm. The, the reality, however, is that mutual respect, good communication, um, democracy helps aid in effective teamwork. Thank you.